Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 70 of Nostalgia Talk. That is true. We have reached uh, episode number 70, and I have to say, it's been a long time coming. I know I probably say that for episode 40, 50, 60, but for this one in particular, we're in the middle of a writer's strike and an actor's strike, and with actors in particular, you know, it's uh, tough for them because they can't talk about past work, and, like, they're still episodes and guests on hold some that haven't even been announced yet I actually have those ones in my phone um but when the strike is over i'm sure that that stuff will clear up so who have we got for episode number 70 let's give a big welcome to the one and only jerry beck <laughs> thank you very much happy to be here happy to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about i love i love cartoons and i love the history of animation and you know let's let's get it on yeah, I'm sure that everybody here loves cartoons as well, just as much as we do. So that's probably mm -hmm. why they're tuning in. For anybody who doesn't know, Jerry is an animation historian, writer, blogger, and also producer. He co-developed the Rugrats movie. He authored the books, The 50 Greatest Cartoons of All Time, which I actually have right here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I <laughs> I'm am. Glad I, everybody can, I'm glad everybody can see that. <laughs> yep. Um so yeah, I did that one and did uh, books on the makings of um, DreamWorks films. He's um, ho he's hosted panels at conventions uh, and also runs the blogs Animation Scoop and Cartoon Research. And uh, I feel like I should bring this up. I actually got my first ever writing piece published on Cartoon Research. You guys probably remember last year I did a special nostalgia talk that was a tribute to legendary animator and director Abe Levito with his daughter Judy sometime mm -hmm. after that was done I get an email from Judy and she's like hey um we didn't realize that it was going to be uh our father's 100th birthday and we'd love we're, we're happy that somebody actually reached out about it would you like to maybe do a blog post about Abe for cartoon research which is run by Jerry Beck you can just write whatever you want to say and uh, you send that to him and uh, then then it got so I sent it to Jerry I wrote everything that I could think of you know Judy's like it doesn't have to be long so it's out there now uh, and uh, cartoon research the link is in the description if you want to uh, read not just that one but anything else that you're interested in when it comes to animation um, so first of all Judy thank you for getting me in touch with Jerry Jerry thank you for uh, putting my work out there no problem happy mm -hmm. to do it Mm -hmm. So let's get started. Uh, what did you aspire to want to become? Because you've gotten to do a little bit of everything. Uh, that actually makes sense. Uh, <laughs> now that I look back at my strange career, that I've gotten a chance to do everything. Because uh, in a way, that's what I kind of wanted. I, I, uh, I initially uh, wanted to be an, uh, a cartoonist. You know, when mm -hmm. you're a, a kid. You know, when you're uh, uh, in the high school. I wanted to be like an underground you know, alternative cartoonist type of thing. And then I went to uh, SVA, School of Visual Arts in New York. And I, in theory, I was trying to be, get myself into the animation business at that time, which was a long time ago in the 1970s. Um, there was no industry in animation. I know it sounds hard to believe, but it had disappeared in the 1970s. It had thrived in the 1930s. It was around in the 19 teens and 20s, uh, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It was thriving. Um, but by the 70s, Walt Disney had passed away. Uh, TV animation was uh, dominant, uh, although the there were some animated features like Ralph Bakshi's films and a couple of things from Disney and a few other. Uh, I think Hanna-Barbera started to make a few features and things. Uh, mainly uh, it, animation as a as a career really dried up. You had to be somebody who really wanted to do it. And most of the people who were already in it were the old timers, the people who were doing it since the 30s, 40s and 50s. They were still in the business in the 1970s, still alive. All the old Popeye cartoonists and uh, Disney cartoonists and Warner cartoonists had all gone on to some other possible place to be, wherever that was, doing TV commercials or whatever. They they had all the jobs. So if you were a young person in the 1970s, like I was, and interested in working in animation, there was hardly any place to do it. The um, 
uh, and that's something I learned. I had like an epiphany at, at somewhere in the early, late, early, mid 70s where, you know, there's no place for me to go with this. I, I want to do it. I like animation. I want to try it. I did try it. But, um, you know, I then I realized that that, like I said, an epiphany. I said, what do I really love about animation? What I love is I love the old films, the films that were made in the 1930s and 40s and 50s and uh, were not being made at that time. Uh, they were being shown on TV, some of them at that time. Um, and uh, there were no books about the history of animation. There was a book on uh, the art of Walt Disney. There was, um, uh, you know, a few other things that were popping up in the mid-70s. I think Joe Adamson, my good friend. It's funny, I'd become friends with a lot of the people who uh, who were writing all the books back in that period. Uh, John Kane Maker, uh, uh, you know, uh, Leslie Kabarga did a book on the Fleischers and Joe Adamson did a book on Tech Savory. And uh, that's about it. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I started to focus in on the history of animation. That was my, became my thing. And it was a lonely, lonely little path back in that period. People who were really into the history of cartoons was few and far between. There was no internet. There was no blogs. There was no... Uh, you know, we didn't have uh, cable TV yet. We didn't have VHS yet. We didn't have tapes. We didn't have recordings. I mean, it was a different universe in the mid seventies to even begin to look into this. Uh, that that got me into the world of sixteen millimeter film collecting because that was the only way one could look at old animated films. You had to actually go out and uh, there was an underground market of buying old TV prints of old cartoons and things like that. And I got part. I was kind of clued into that thing. And so, you know, I, I I sought out whoever I could seek out. Uh, there was one fanzine of note, uh, a very wonderful one called Funny World by a, a, a guy who's still with us, Michael Barrier. He was written one of the greatest books, several of them on animation history, one called uh, Hollywood Cartoons that I highly recommend. And he that book didn't come out until I think, you know, like, like 15 years ago without looking uh, it up. He worked on that book for like 30 years, but um, there was really nothing uh, out there. I, I, and again, not, I'll try to uh, shorten my story a little bit. I, uh, but I, I, being in New York, uh, I found that there was a class at the new school for social research in the village. There was a class being taught about the history of animation and it was being taught by a guy named Leonard Malton. And yes, I had, the, uh, had the film critic Leonard Malton. Yes. Well, at the time, he was a writer who had written several books like the great movie shorts. And he wrote a great book that came out in 73, I think, called uh, The Disney Films. And this was like 19 when, I, when I'm the year I'm talking about is like 1973 or four. I actually can't mm -hmm. remember right now. His, his Disney Films book had just come out. And I'm thinking, I got to take this class and I should meet this guy because I've read his books. And this guy, no, we're, we're like in the same wavelength. And, um, you know, I just I don't know anybody else who's interested in the history of animation. People were interested in the history of film. Uh, you know, there were all kinds of books that were just coming out then about uh, film history and other aspects of it. But animation history was kind of a uh, it was just not there. And so long story short, I, I took this college level course. I paid good money, you know, a lot of money tuition to go to this course and came in and there were literally four people, five people, maybe less than 10 people in the class. And I was one of them. And of course, I was a very eager, very eager young man at that time. And I went up and I introduced myself at the end and got him to sign my book which he dated so i have a i actually have somewhere the uh the book with the, his autograph and the date that we met and so i i know wow. how long we've, we've been together and thing is we became friends from pretty much that moment on no other student they were all there taking it for credit i wasn't i wasn't taking it for credit i just wanted to meet the guy and know more about animation history and you know that that kind of thing and uh we ended up becoming very very good friends forever we're still friends today and um, and that led uh, during the next, you know, seven, six, seven years to us working together on what would become a book that would come out in 1980 called Of Mice and Magic. And uh, 
And we worked on that for many, many years. Uh, uh, and, 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 and thus, when it came out, we, you know, we had a sense of pride that because no one else was doing anything like this. You know, no one was really looking into the history. And we I was very proud. I'm still proud of for many years of the uh, of, of publishing some information in there that was nowhere else at that time to be found. I mean, today you can find everything on the Internet. But oh, yeah, but then it was that was the Internet. <laughs> there was no there was no Internet back then. So that's that's what I was interested in. And that's roughly how I got into it all. And I'm happy to take any other questions regarding that or where I went from there uh, or anything else you want to ask. Well, it's cool that you uh, got to collaborate and also learn from the, Mm -hmm. of course, the incredibly knowledgeable Leonard Malton. Like I've seen Leonard Malton speak. I've talked to him before such a knowledgeable guy. And like, cause I, he, uh, for any of the listeners who don't know, Leonard hosted the Walt Disney treasures, uh, DVD collection. And I remember mm-hmm. watching those and I'm like, this guy's a, a great host, but he's also a uh, film critic. Um, right. like not just for animation, like general, uh, films. And that's interesting to me as somebody who does film for a living, you know, cause I was inspired by Disney and Warner brothers and Muppets and all mm-hmm. that. And then, when I got to film school, we were watching stuff that had more of a serious kind of tone to it. Right. And that inspired me to check out more dramatic films, such as The Matrix, for example. I had never seen anything like that before in my whole life, like and it or, or Dead Poet Society. Like both mm-hmm. of those films by themselves aren't funny or goofy like the traditional animated film is, but it's a different style of it. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought up uh, Leonard Malton. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that's, you know, I always wanted to do something in animation, artwork, cartooning, that was my thing. And, but, I, but honestly, after, when I gave up my, dare I say, I gave up my dream of being an actual animator, I, uh, I didn't really give it up completely, but I gave up mainly my, my dream of that. But I, I knew I wanted to work in the field, but I didn't know what I could do what I would do. I didn't know how, what was my place. I was also like, like you, a movie buff. I was a film buff. You know, I love TV shows too, but let's say the film. Uh, uh, but I, I was a movie buff and, um, and I had this weird thing, even as a kid, I loved looking at the posters, you mm-hmm. know, at the movie theater. I loved, uh, I loved everything about movies. I liked the coming attraction trailer. I liked the, uh, you know, I loved everything about the whole experience of of seeing a movie in a movie theater. That's how I was raised. Today, mm-hmm. I don't I don't know how people are being raised today, but that's the way I was raised. And now um, there's so much on streaming networks too. Yeah, I know it's 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 it, but it's a different perspective. It's I mean the romantic aspects of 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 this is how it was in my day. And I'm talking about my day. I'm talking about like when I was a little kid in the '60s. I would open the newspaper, physical newspaper, and I'd go to the movie section in that paper, and there would be advertising for the new movies that were playing. And I would see the ads, and I'd get, they'd get me all excited. Okay, I want to see this one. I want to see this movie. I want to see that. And then you'd, you'd see that ad with its graphics, with the lettering and, and images. And I, I, I love that. And then then I'd go to the theater and there'd be the marquee in the old days. We didn't, <laughs> in my day, we didn't have uh, multiplexes, but they came in in the seventies. Yeah. In the 1970s and eighties, but so in like 60s, one of those movie theaters where it was just like one theater, right? It's one theater. We had and, one like that here for years. Yeah. And but that's, but that's the way it used to be back in the, you know, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties. Right. That's just the way it was. So I kind of came in at the tail end of that. And so, mm-hmm. You'd, you'd you'd walk in like for example i'll give you um i want to give a i want to give a good example i'm trying to think of a, a specific film okay i saw i saw believe it or not i saw goldfinger the third james bond movie in a movie theater when i was a kid and mm-hmm. i remember you see so you walk into the theater and on the marquee uh, out in the street there'd be this giant marquee and it would say goldfinger you know james bond is back and goldfinger and I, that would already again i'm excited Get toward the theater. There's the posters, and there's some back. They used to do back in the old days. I love this. I still love this. Nobody does it now. You, the, the theater would actually have uh, still photos 
from the movie it would be outside the theater, uh, you know, right when you're coming in, there'd be the poster and there'd be like five or six uh, still black and white, still photos, sometimes in color. And like, that would excite me. It's like, oh boy, this is, this is what's in there. This is what the movie that's going to be in there. And then you pay your, whatever it is to get in your admission at that time. And you go in and there's that smell of popcorn and all that. And you go in, I mean, everything about going to the movies to me was uh, like pleasure. It was just a giant theme park ride for me. And so when I um, came of age, you know, when I, when I uh, was, was, slightly discouraged uh, on my uh my my you know my career as being a cartoonist or an animator uh i wasn't completely discouraged but i because i i kept drawing i'm not a great artist but i i, I drew, drew a lot when i was a kid and and then uh but i i lucked out again i had another piece of luck which was being in new york i had you know i had to go start working i had to get a job i started working in a few places that you know, uh, large business companies. Um, uh, the uh, I started working for uh, some of the companies on Wall Street and things like that, just to just to earn a living. And then I found out about I didn't know this. I didn't know this at all because I lived in New York. I thought all the movie studios were in uh, L.A. in Ca Hollywood, California. And I uh, found out that United Artists, uh, the company that released the Pink Panther movies. The Woody Allen movies, the uh, the Rocky films, things like that. They were in, they were actually based in New York, in Times Square. Anyway, I found out about this and I applied for a job there. And uh, wow. I still remember walking into this office building in New York back in the seventies. You went to work, you had to wear a tie. You had to wear you had to dress up to go to work. You know, back in those days, and. Um, and everything was boring. You went to work and it was just, you know, the, everything about the offices were, were just boring. And I walked in the United Artists on Times Square and I went up in the elevator, got off, the oh, doors open and there was immediately movie posters for movies that had won Oscars for uh, United Artists, like West Side Story, nice. Around the World in 80 Days and things like that. And one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, the minute the elevator door opened and I saw movie posters on the wall, I mean, I can't even begin to recreate this for anybody else because it was just the experience that I had, which was seeing movie posters on the wall of an office building. I was like, okay, I have to work here. I have to work here. It was like, I have to work this somewhere. This is where I belong. Yeah. This is where I belong. And I ended up, again, by luck, I had the qualifications to work in the computer room uh, 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 the 18th floor of the uh, of the uh, of the United Artists in Manhattan, and I got this job there. And I figured as long as I get my foot in the door, I'll figure mm -hmm. out a way to work with movies somehow. It took two years, but I ended up working for uh, there's what they call the 16 millimeter department, which is the department that rents their films to colleges, high schools, hospitals, prisons, uh, any kind of not what they call non theatrical, non movie theater. Uh, place to do it plus i had my hands on the entire library of united artists which included all the mgm and, and warner brothers movies all the looney tunes all the mg all the popeye cartoons it, i mean i mean wow i was actually i was actually working with all this material and i could take the films home because i as i mentioned before i got into the universe of 16 millimeter collecting so i could take the films home and watch them at home so this was and this is the late 70s in the early 80s i was like in heaven and mm -hmm. I, I had this i wasn't in the movie i was in the movie business in a way but i wasn't in the animation business and i can go on from there i mean working for united artists was it taught me a trade i learned film distribution i learned what that was about and how to do it and that led to other opportunities. I have a feeling I'm going to tell you about those opportunities and what happened to me. But what, yeah, another, thing did, what another thing it did, though, was that um, was that uh, uh, United Artists in 19 uh, around 1980. See, I was still really, really heavily into animation. And, and around 1980 or so, uh, Don Bluth. Do you know that name, Don? I Bluth? do. Yes. Uh, for any of the listeners who don't, Don Bluth is the person uh, responsible for American Tale, for instance. Right. And Don Bluth came to New York and apparently went to a lot of cities around the country. Was trying to recruit animators. 
1979, Don Bluth led an exodus from the Disney studio. Don Bluth and 11 other animators were key people working on The Fox and the Hound at Disney, but they quit the studio in protest because they wanted to make films that looked like the films Disney was making in the 1940s or 50s. They wanted something that would look like Peter Pan or Cinderella, you know, or, you know, something that looked like that. The, the movies they were making in the 70s and 80s were far from those movies that they were making back in the older days. Right. And so they they tried many ways at the, at the Disney studio to convince the management that we can do this. It won't really cost you that much more to make them better. But they, it fell on deaf ears and they decided to hell with it. We'll do it ourselves. And they quit the studio and it became a major headline. Uh, the New York Times and many other papers that never, ever, ever in those days covered animation had a big front page story about how it was an exodus at Disney and uh, led by Don Bluth. And they, they, they bought the rights to this book that became the movie The Secret of Nim. And um, they were working on that. And Don Bluth came to New York and he was showing the first scenes that were finished from The Secret of Nim to anyone who would listen. They, and he went to a lot of schools like the School of Visual Arts and others and the New School. And he would show, it was basically the, the scene, if you know that film, where Mrs. Brisby meets the owl uh, for the first time, the, 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 the John Carradine owl character. Beautiful sequence. And he was showing that and people like me, my, our minds were blown back in those days because nothing in animation that was currently new in 1980 looked like that. You know, nothing looked like that. It looked like something out of the 40s or 30s. And so he, he did a very, very persuasive job. My point is somewhere around 1981 or so in my little 16 millimeter department at United Artists, my boss said, who knew I loved animation, said, listen, we're, gonna, we're, we're picking up some new animated films. Guess what? They said they were picking up this film called The Secret of Nim. I went nuts. I went crazy. I went. Because you went, knew about oh, it already. I yeah. knew about it. I said, holy sh that's going to be giant. Now, it didn't turn out to be giant, but it was, but it, but I, but I was like, this is the revolutionary. This is, and, and look, I was kind of a, I, was, I, I had gotten to myself to the position of being a sales clerk, a salesman. So I, I you know, I, I told the people, I said, this next time they call from that studio, I'd love to speak to them if you don't mind. And I still remember one day I was sitting at my desk and this is sec secretary comes over and goes, you said you wanted to speak to Mr. Don Bluth, uh, Mr. D Gary Goldman, that was his, his second in command, <clears throat> is on the phone. Would you like to speak to him? I go, yes, I would. And I went right over and I said, hi, my name is Jerry Beck. And um, uh, I saw the footage from this film and I'm I'm blown away. And I... I Anyway, long story short, I started a relationship with Bluth and Gary Goldman, and um, I ended up uh, come, becoming like a de facto. This, this, this. I was still working for United Artists in my job that I had there, but on the side, I became kind of a little little publicity man for Don Bluth because I wanted people to know about this movie, and they gave me they gave me film footage, they gave me slides, they gave me all sorts of stuff, and I I started going to comic book conventions back then. And I became a preacher of the gospel of the secret of Nim. I would do these little programs at at Comic Con, saying you got to see this movie. And I, would, my enthusiasm for it was 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 fantastic. Um, United Artists really botched the distribution of that movie. I, I, that could be a whole podcast unto itself. They really really messed it up. That summer, the summer it came out was the summer of E. T. and uh, and U. A. itself had uh, Spielberg's other film, Poltergeist. So. They took uh, the center position and a film like Secret of Nim, which was horribly distributed. Again, that's a longer discussion. Um, really, really, it just bombed out and nobody saw it. Nobody knew it was there. And even if they were aware of it, uh, it didn't look attractive to anybody because of the marketing. It was just pretty badly done. The um, taught me a lot of lessons about film distribution. I heard didn't already know. And um and you know that's it's it's so the idea of i actually enjoyed being in film distribution because you were at the center of the storm and even if the storm blew over like the movie came out and it bombed there was another movie coming up and another movie behind it and another and i loved being involved with the the movies that were coming the marketing 
um, you know, that that sort of thing. Uh, being in film distribution, you're actually involved with almost every part of the movie except making it the movie itself. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just thought that was just a great place for me to be at that time. Um, in 1984, I moved over. Um, I joined some of my friends from United Artists who were starting up the Orion Pictures Classics Division, and I joined them. And uh, and then and those people today are still they're still in business. They're 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 still distribute movies. That's, great. Um, that's the people who run uh, Sony Pictures Classics, which I'm sure you've heard of as a, as yep. a studio, and. It's Tom Bernard and Michael Barker, and those were my friends that we we all worked together in the sixteen millimeter department, and then we were involved with classics. They call them classics, which is which is uh, sixteen millimeter was non theatrical. Classics was theatrical, meaning they played the movies in regular movie theaters. But what they did was they played the movies that United Artists either didn't want to release or were too hard to release. Movies that were more of art films, foreign films oddball things and that was cool i like that i learned from them literally how to become a one-man film distributor when i say one man at that time i would say a 10 person film distributor back in our classics days we literally had like 10 people on staff everybody doing a different job um you know talking to the theaters shipping the film prints getting the advertising ready doing publicity making the trailers all that stuff making the press notes um pulling film clips for tv stations all sorts of things that would take a major studio would have departments for each one of these people but it was we, we we streamlined it down to 10 people i then i'm i'm, I'm sorry i'm going off on my career here but i okay. then went um because there's two parts to, there's three or four parts to my career one is the what i did for a living every day and then there's the mm -hmm. <laughs> what i really wanted to do which was to be an animation historian and i was doing that at night i was doing that constantly when i wasn't doing my day job but um but i uh i uh i then i then worked for orion classics for two years and then i got an offer that came out of the blue that was perfect for me it was um landmark theaters uh still around theater chain that had mainly art theaters uh in every, a lot, many many cities um and um the um uh, they started a division that they called Expanded Entertainment. And their division, they, they were essentially becoming a separate film distributor, yet they were under the wing of Landmark Theaters, the theater chain. And uh, they, they, what they thought, what they came up with on their own was to distribute uh, this festival of animation that would play in the art theaters. They could, you know, it'd be like, it was called the Tournée of Animation. And it would be like the best animated shorts of that year compiled in a collection and shown in a theater. And um, all they were missing was someone who knew how to put the movies in the movie theaters. And unbelievably, that was me because I knew how to put the movies in the theaters <clears throat> and and I knew a heck of a lot about animation. Mm -hmm. So I was like the perfect employee for them. I was the perfect person for them. And I got hired. I had to move to California, which I wanted to do. And I'm glad I did. And so it all um, works out then. It was all perfect. Leonard Malton yeah. had just moved to California for entertainment tonight. So my friend was out here. I had other friends out here. So so it worked out that way. And um uh and I I started doing that uh, we became then a, a three people film distribution company, mm -hmm. this, you know, making the trailers, doing the notes, calling the theaters. We we did everything from what I had learned. And we played, the, we put these movies in theaters. And I want to just give you the last postscript without giving a giant story on it. But I left Expanded, uh, you know, I left Expanded. And uh, by 1980, let's see, I moved to Expanded in 86. And then in 1988, I teamed up with one other fellow. And we started a, what I would almost call a one man, maybe one and a half or two man um, film distribution company that we called Streamline Pictures. I was and just about to ask you about Streamline Pictures. I have okay. that uh, in here as All I was right. doing well, my I'll research stop there, for but it. We started, we start, I'll, ask, I'll, let, I'll stop, I'll pause to let you ask me the question and then I'll I'll give you the whole story on well, Streamline. Well, well you're, it, you, it starts, you started out right there perfectly. I was going to ask you, how did it all come about? Yeah, well, there you go. Me telling you that whole story was not a complete waste of time. <laughs> so, not at all. 
the um yeah streamline okay again forgetting my work as an animation historian which was on the side every other hour that i wasn't doing my day jobs <clears throat> and that's a whole other story but back to the day jobs well so <laughs> what happened was the um i was always aware of of anime i was aware of all animation all animation not just classic cartoons looney tunes a lot of people don't know that about me but i'm interested in the whole of animation all of animation yeah because you and, uh, as i said in the intro you wrote no. uh the 50 greatest cartoons of all time and that's not just specific no. to looney tunes and disney like it's got for anybody yeah. who hasn't heard of the book i i am going to get to that eventually but for anybody who hasn't heard of the book it's got it's the whole nine yards of animation like yeah yeah so so the um so i wanted to, i you know I, I was into it all uh, i mean i grew up in, again I, I keep saying the word the sentence i grew up in new york but that's a key factor because i had access to um the museum of modern art the museum of modern art had a regular daily film program and showing animation from around the world was part of that and I, so i got exposed to the works of great animators around the world you know just regularly in, in new york and i joined a group in new york called asifa asifa which is an international animation organization that was started in the late 50s and early 60s and and in new york if a world-class famous name animator from another country came into town two in particular that i can think of are bruno bizzetto we did a film called Allegro and Antropo, which I highly recommend. It's a parody of Fantasia. I'll leave it, wow. leave it at that. And uh, uh, another person you may or may not have heard of is a guy named uh, Osamo Tezuka. Osamo Tezuka, who has passed away many years ago now, but I got to meet him. I, I, it's hard for me to say I became his friend, but we, he knew we, we were friendly. <clears throat> and um, but Tezuka was the guy who invented anime, really. He was the biggest cartoonist in Japan in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And he was the first person allowed to do an animated TV series, which was, we call it Astro Boy. He invented yep. that and many other great characters. He's a spectacular comic artist and he was a great animator. And I can go on and on about Tezuka, but I won't right now. But I got to meet Tezuka. Again, this is part of my experience of being in New York on the side of my my day job so what happened was i was well aware of what we call anime for decades uh and from when it began i watched astro boy when it was on tv as a kid but um when when um at various times in my career of film distribution i would bring in uh something like a, a brand new anime film in the 1970s or early 80s to my my bosses i'd say here's a film it's really cool science fiction it's not really for kids and they would look at it and go this is a saturday morning cartoon we're not distributing saturday morning cartoons here so i, I would get turned down and I, I shrugged my shoulders and let it go so when i got the job in in la with uh, expand entertainment and we were distributing anime uh, animation I, 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 you know, we were distributing uh, animation from all around the world. I, uh, I'd bring in one of these anime features, you know, uh, and I'd show it to my boss there. And he goes, well, you know, and same thing. He said, well, this is like a Saturday morning cartoon. We don't run this sort of, we don't, we don't distribute this. We distribute classy international award winners, you know, that kind of thing. And I said, yeah, but there's an audience for this. Now, let me back up and say, I'd been going to Comic-Con since they were invented. My first Comic-Con was when I was when I was age 13 in New York City, 1968. It was the, although there had been little Comic-Con gatherings before, the first real Comic-Con was in 68 at the uh, Statler Hilton Hotel. Hotel, it's being dis uh, dismantled right now in New York City, the Hotel Pennsylvania. Um, but um that uh, that hotel had the first Comic Con, and it continued from that point on. I I've never missed the Comic Con except for COVID. I didn't have COVID, but the except for the COVID shutdowns, I I've been right. to a Comic Con every summer since I was thirteen. Mm -hmm. And 
going to the comic cons now they weren't the way they are today back then there wasn't even a thousand people there was like probably 300 people at the convention i went to back in those days but and then it would grow slowly incrementally you know 300 400 500 throughout the years um but even in the mid 70s i was well aware of uh, japanese animation in fact i used to run the film program by the late 70s i was with my because of my interest in 16 millimeter film uh and my collection of cartoons i was I, I brought my projector to the comic cons i got hired to actually show movies at the comic conventions and i would go to the japanese distributors in new york city and say do you have any 16 millimeter of your shows in japan with the giant robots that i could show at the comic con they would loan me 16 millimeter prints to show at this convention and there was definitely a, a, an emerging a fandom for anime when vhs came in after 19 let's say 78 or so around 1980 um uh there was because japan also had the same ntsc uh, tv system we have people started trading tapes with fans in japan and suddenly more anime got shown in the united states usually at little rooms at comic cons little anime rooms and so again i was aware that there was a fandom for anime and but but as you may or may not know, no one in this country was distributing anime. The only the few anime that was being distributed were some of the TV shows, like Speed Racer, you know, uh, Gigantor, uh, and and after Star Wars came out, shows like what we called Star Blazers and Battle of the Planets, Gotcha Man, and uh, I forgot the names of the original names right now. But some of the other some of the Japanese shows started getting distributed here. Mostly they were syndicated. No TV network would pick them up. Very few of their anime features got distributed in the United States. And when they did, a film like Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind from Hayao Miyazaki was was was, was stripped down in 88 minutes from a two-hour length, was dubbed in so as if it were a Disney fairy tale. The posters and everything made it look like it was an entertaining family film, even though it was filled with blood and gore. And um, it was just a horrible situation. So what happened was um, when I left Streamline Pictures, uh, I'm sorry, when I, I'm sorry, when I left Expanded Entertainment, which was distributing these classy art films, another thing we did at Expanded <clears throat> at the time was we decided to start a magazine called Animation Magazine. That magazine still exists. You may may have seen it, uh, but Animation Magazine yeah, is a trade was, magazine. As I was now. researching for this, I actually uh, discovered yeah. that it existed. Yeah. We started that at, at that time. I was one of the original editors of it. The um, so uh, I left that company. They ne they couldn't believe I left because at the time, where else was I going to work? This company was the perfect place for me. We were doing a magazine. We were distributing animation. What more do I want? Well, part of me wanted to distribute an anime, and nobody was interested. And um, one of the things we did, another thing we did at that company that connects to the anime thing was that we, we put on in LA, we put on an actual festival. We called it the animation celebration. And we spent a whole week at one theater where we showed shorts, uh, new shorts, new animated features from around the world. We did retrospectives of classic animation. We had guests. It was fantastic. This was 1986, 87, 88. And, um, when we were doing that, we were so desperate for new animated features, so desperate that my boss at the time relented and allowed me to show a new anime feature because he couldn't care less. And that film was Castle in the Sky by Hayao Miyazaki, which is considered a classic. And But but to the, to the mainstream normal human being, A, in the public and, and in Hollywood, they could not care less about this crap. I say that with air quotes. So... Um, so we showed, um, we showed that I also, my, a friend of mine, uh, had put together, a, a, a an anime feature, uh, based on a TV show he worked on that he created. And that show was called Robotech mm -hmm. and Robotech was kind of a, a friend of, this friend of mine worked for a company that was distributing, uh, foreign films. And they got the idea they 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 you needed like sixty five episodes to syndicate a show on American television, but they had all of these weird science fiction shows 
that uh, that were of various lengths, and none of them added. None of them were sixty five episodes. So my friend came up with this idea of Robotech, which was I'm going to combine all three of three of these shows of of these very that you know one was forty episodes, one was twenty episodes, that kind of thing. It was like it was a big mess. He combined them all. He dubbed it so that they all somehow became one story. And they they called it Robotech, and they put that on TV and actually gained a cult following, a following that still exists today. And he put together a movie called Robotech the Movie, which was all he took a, an anime feature based on the one of the original shows that that were part of the Robotech thing, and he created a movie that tied into the TV show. The movie didn't get any real distribution, but. But we show, but we were so desperate for anime animated features of any kind for this festival. We we showed it at our festival, and I think it was in eighty seven. And what happened was, um, my my bosses couldn't care about the care less about this animation stuff. We were showing computer animation, which was new. You know, this is pre, you know, Pixar was was around, but this was right around the time of uh, Tin Toy. You know, it was or that kind of thing. It was anime uh, computer animation was the kind of the hot thing in 1987 um anime was still considered you know children's you know fair so uh we had i love this part of this the opening night my boss was so greedy for money that he invited the universe of everyone in animation to come to the opening night and then they'd have a big tented party outside the theater uh, afterward the opening night movie you might have heard of was called The Brave Little Toaster. Yep. And 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 that had nobody had seen that movie. At, and this was a world premiere. And they had ever, all the elite of Hollywood uh, of the of the animation community were there. They had a big tented party where they actually gave away cells. Uh animation cells from the movie were given to everybody who attended. It was amazing. And but because my boss was so greedy for butts in the seats, making every dollar he could make. He invited all these people for free. We've got to make some money. We're renting a theater. He he said, what can we run while the party is running? What can we run? Oh, his brainstorm was, we'll run one of those anime features that no one cares about. And, and, and that I told him that there was such a cult audience for. I go, all right. We ran Robo. I think it was Robotech. It might have been the other one, Castle in the Sky. I can't remember which one it was. I think it was Robotech we ran that night, maybe. And... Or maybe it was Castle in the Sky now that I think about it. Because I remember what happened was, so the, so the opening night movie, Grave Little Toaster, everybody comes out to the tented party. And then they had pre-sold, you know, all the tickets. None of our animation festival events sold out in advance, except maybe the computer animation program. That was really hot. Mm-hmm. The only other two things that sold out in advance, sold out in advance, were the two anime features. Now, even that did not say anything. I I would go back and go, okay, obviously there's an audience for this. Uh, uh, and we're, you know, because yeah, th- their attitude was, nope, it's still a kid's crap. We're not going to distribute that. Don't stop asking us. I said, but it's sold out. Don't you care? They, no, they didn't care. How can they so, not care? It gets them money. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And so while everybody, including my bosses, were at the party hobnobbing with the elite of the lead of animation, um, the the anime fans were lined up. They all went into the auditorium. Um, the movie goes on. And somewhere after the first half hour, I decide, you know what? I want to see what this anime looks like on a uber big screen. I had seen it on a small screening room screen, but I wanted to see it on, the big, on a big screen. And I also wanted to hear the audience reaction. I went inside and the only other person be, that wasn't sitting in a theater in a seat was in the back of the auditorium like, like I was. And it was my friend. My partner, my friend named Carl Masick, who was the guy who put the movie together. And we're both standing there. And first of all, we're both in awe of the picture. It looks great on the big screen. I go, this is really something and different. Uh, I mean, I've been watching this on the small screen, but boy, oh boy, it really works well on the big screen. And then and then uh then we we also didn't say much because the audience reaction was fantastic. They were cheering, they were applauding. I, I mean. I'm standing there and I'm looking at my friend and I'm saying, we got to put this, we got to put this movie out. We got to put this movie out somehow. I goes, yeah, but I, this movie is tied up with the company I made it for. I go, 
I go, well, you know, the other movie we're showing, Castle in the Sky, has no distributor. I go, and my people, my company won't pick it up. And I go, then we ended up starting a dialogue from that night. We ended up meeting in lots of coffee shops. And we ended up talking about, well, I know how to distribute these movies. And my friend Carl knew how to dub them in English. That was what his specialty was. And I was very much into marketing and this and that. And very, very slowly, we we ended up talking to the, the Japanese distributors. All of them were in L.A. We never had to go to Japan. Everybody, every company that made Japanese animation had an office in L.A. And they all were there for one reason, to try to get their movies distributed. So we walked in and we basically told them, look, I do that. I have done it. We just did this. Give us this movie. We'll put it in movie theaters. Whatever we make, we'll split with you. You, you can then take the movie and put it on home video and sell it to a video distributor because they'll have seen that it came out and got some reviews in America and, and you can help sell it. And we, we, we sold them on the idea of loaning us the movie or I, I like to say loaning us the movie or letting us distribute the movie and uh, uh, put it out. We started with Castle in the Sky. Uh, we found another oddity, a live action animation film that no one even today I don't think has heard of called Twilight of the Cockroaches. But that was a real oddity uh, that we found. It was live action animation with subtitles. And we didn't even dub that film at the time. We dubbed it later, actually. And then and then we then picked up a film that we liked from about five, ten years earlier called Lensman. And and that was the beginning of, of Streamline Pictures. We started making the posters, the trailers. It was me and Carl for, initially out of our apartments. Then we finally got a little rental space. And um and then and then it was in the air. Marvel was printing a com the comic book version, the manga version as a Marvel epic comic book. And that was wow. a thing called Akira, right? And we knew there was an Akira film. We had seen a bootleg copy of it. It had just come, come out in Japan. And we immediately started contacting the people of the Akira committee uh, to uh, tell them who we were. Their attitude initially was, oh, oh no, oh no, we, we're going to get like an MGM or a Paramount or a you know, a Columbia Pictures or something like that. Uh, you know, we, we were too small potatoes for them. And they they dubbed it themselves, actually, uh, However, as opposed to what we were doing. And by the way, that's a whole other story that I guess I won't get into now. But we had another attitude about dubbing the films, which was completely different from whatever had been done before us, because we dubbed them with respect. Um, we dubbed them as if this is the way it would have sounded if if you were listening to it in Japanese. We tried to cast people who sounded like the Japanese voices. We 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 didn't change the the uh, the music or special effects sound effects. We didn't do anything like that. We presented the movie the way you would have seen it in Japan, except it's in English and not Japanese, and no cuts, no this, no that. So we told them that you know this was our attitude. Anyway, after about six months, they actually they actually had a uh, they actually had a guy that they paid to hang out with us and watch what we do, kind of what they today would say, auditing us. They they hung out and saw how we do what we do and what we really think about this stuff. And they we came away perfectly. They, they, they got the impression you know, we are the real deal. We love anime. We're treating it with respect. And we know what we're doing about getting it into movie theaters. And so um, they trusted us uh, after being turned down by every studio in Hollywood. I'm not, again, I, I could tell you some very funny stories of them showing Akira to Hollywood um, and how quickly they were thrown out of the, the studio. Um, after a little bit of that, they, they decided to work with us to help distribute the movie, which we did. And we did a lot of good things for them and we made it we made it we got it on Siskel and Ebert the biggest review show at the time and we did everything we could possibly do to get that movie shown and seen and um uh and we did it very proud i have some great photos we got the uh, uh Mr. Otomo came to New York on our behalf and did an autograph signing at a comic book store and i did a Q&A with him in front of the theater and uh, you know, we, we had a lot of great experiences uh, distributing that. And that also, of course, allowed us to what I call cherry pick from the other studios. We were allowed to pick what we thought were the best movies from other places that we could distribute. Movies that we thought were great at the time were things like, 
again, this was at the time, you know, Vampire Hunter D, uh, Goal Goal 13, Fist of the North Star. That's a pretty odd one. Um, uh, Wicked City. Um, I'm, I'm probably leaving out a whole bunch, but um, we, we picked up all of our favorite films at that time. Um, and um, and we basically started that. I mean, I, I, I don't say that to boast, but I, I don't think we've got enough credit for starting uh, what what is now an incredible movement. I, when I work, walk into in L.A., we have a thing called Anime Expo, which is un, it's like Comic-Con. It's like one hundred and fifty thousand people, you know, and it's only about anime. And it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, that, I, that's I that's interesting because, like, I I go to uh, stuff like Halcon, which is Halifax's Comic Con that we have here, yeah. and there's people that are dressed up as all these anime characters. Yeah. And it's only recently that I've gotten into anime. Like, I always knew what it was. I grew up when Pokemon was popular, but I didn't grow up knowing that much about it. Um, right. It's funny. My cousin, my little cousin, was just here and he was showing us how to play Pokemon Go. We were at the beach and he's like, "Got a Pokemon." Um, so it, it it did going to Halcon and seeing all these anime characters inspired me to watch stuff like Spirited Away and Howl's oh, Moving yeah. Castle. Yeah. And uh, I got to say, it it's really, really well written. And like, especially when it comes to animation as well, like, because um, as I said before, like some people see animation as kind of humorous and stuff like that. This um had definitely, well, those two in particular, Spirited Away and Howl's Moving Castle had kind of like an edgier feeling to them. Right. There, there's definitely there, there there to me boy it's interesting from my perspective because everything everything seem it with anime in my head everything mm-hmm. seems to lead up to Miyazaki you know uh, uh Totoro we dubbed Totoro yep, that's we, on, that's on my uh, list of things to watch oh yeah we did the first dub of that but then uh, then uh, a few years later it's so funny I I have a Here's a story that'll that'll uh, be banked for a long time. But when we were distributing Castle in the Sky, we uh, we actually uh, uh, the Disney animation staff. You know, I, don't, I still don't know to this day why they didn't call us up and ask to borrow a film print and screen it at the studio. But what they did was they actually supported us. The entire staff came to the theater we were running it in L.A. I happened to be there to see them come in, and they all sat into and went into the theater and watched. Uh, Castle in the Sky. It was the first time that I'd ever seen anything like that. It was the Disney animation staff with the head guy, um, and and uh, I never forgot that, especially from that moment, because that was the beginning of, in my mind, that Disney being aware of the Miyazaki films, which ultimately, a few years later, they of course bought the rights to distribute uh, and redub. And um, so my point is, is that we, we did the original dubbings for Kiki and uh, and uh, Totoro and, and, and they they redubbed them in recent years. But our, our dub is, is still out there. People still refer to the streamlined dub on a lot of these movies. But the um, the uh, yeah, I, for me, up to that point of, of, of Castle in the Sky, Totoro and Akira, which was like 1988. Every anime leads to that period. But then. But then, and it doesn't go downhill. It kind of goes up from that period. It's kind of like, and in some ways, those films together are sort of the Snow White of an, of anime. You know, in in American animation, everything kind of leads to Snow White, and then and then animation takes off from there. And I think uh, with anime, everything kind of led to those films, and then it's gone on from there. There's some great filmmakers. Uh, now there's some great stuff on TV animation. I don't follow it all. Nobody follows it all. In fact, if anybody's listening, follows it all literally. Come, come right for my blogs. But um, because nobody really can, uh, it's it's just there's just too much uh stuff. But there's great stuff amongst it, and stuff that's absolutely important and worthy of seeing. And I I gotta say. I would say offhand, I mean, I'm amazed that I was involved with the beginning of the Miyazaki films, but Miyazaki's films and Akira in particular are definitely watershed moments in, in for anime in particular and for animation. They both have uh, important things in them that uh, that people have been influenced by. It's it's influence, I think, is part yeah. of the importance of these of some of these films. You wouldn't have The Matrix if it wasn't for like Akira. You wouldn't have some of the movies that have come out because of some of the visuals 
by the way, most of the great filmmakers, James Cameron and onward, Spielberg, they're all very aware of anime. They're all oh, yeah. very aware of, of 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 at least the period that I grew up with. You know the the you know the Miyazaki slash Akira era, and you know I'm kind of really happy that I played a little part, an itty bitty part with that. I then again I don't want to go on, uh, and we're going to run out of time. But I then went into uh, after five years or so of uh, of doing all that, I actually felt very satisfied. Um, when I left my, the company, I sold it to my partner. We we had two or three competitors who were doing exactly what we were trying to do. And that's great. We, you know, they weren't there before. I'm glad I'm leaving it with that. We we had done all the cherry picked films that I wanted to see distributed. <clears throat> so I was okay with where we were. And uh, <clears throat> I, that's when I actually left uh, the company and I went on to other things. Some of those other things were uh, the book you held up, the 50 greatest cartoons I did right in the aftermath of. Uh, yes, uh, that was actually going to be my uh, my next question, how uh, that all happened, like because uh, as I'm reading it for the first time, yeah. I'm like, how how was it picked these cartoons in particular? So like how how did you uh, go about with all of this? Okay. Like, did, like, did you just like ask people, what do you guys think are some of the best cartoons ever? Close. Um, okay. First of all, I. I when I was putting the book together, <clears throat> I was getting some immediate criticism about who am I to pick the 50 greatest cartoons. So that's why if you look at the book carefully, it says I, I made them change it. I made them change it. To say, it says edited by Jerry Beck. And we played up that it was chosen by I think the cover even says it the chosen by over a thousand animation professionals. Um, <clears throat> the you know, if you look at it now, so you see that, like, you know, I mean, I you know, on the title page, it says like edited by the and I did that was on, done on purpose because people kept saying, "Well, that's Jerry Beck's fiftieth fifty greatest. That's not mine, you know that kind of thing." But so what we did was we went, we created a form. I actually still have these in my garage. I still have the ballots. Um, we oh, that's actually cool. we actually went to um, we didn't the I guess the internet the internet might have been around, but we we really weren't using the internet then. We went to uh, probably by mail. That's why I still have physical ballots. Um, we we wrote to and went to animators at all the studios. We went to peep critics, a la Leonard Malton and and others. You know that, that we knew were familiar with this. We went to filmmakers. We went to uh, uh, animation school teachers at that time, which were not as many as we have today. And. Um, you know, we 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 just put cast a wide net. We we created a form which I haven't looked at in years. I'll have to look at it again. Where we gave them suggestions. I threw out, you know, like Warner Brothers, and I had like about you know twenty five, thirty Warner Brothers cartoons listed, maybe more <clears throat> that maybe they could choose from. Then I'd have like write in your own, you know, and then we'd give them lots of space to write in. And so we sent out this ballot. We got a, a whole bunch of them back. You don't ever get. However many you send out, you only get a, a 50% or less even uh, back whenever you do anything like this. And, um, you know, and we we basically, the, the, the titles that are there are the titles that were. I personally, people have asked me all along, well, do you agree with this list completely? And I go, you know what? The first 25 are pretty much what I would have on a first 25 if I were actually going to make a list like this. Okay. Um, I think there are definitely ones in the later half that aren't. And that's why <clears throat> that's why I kind of had a, my little extra say at the back of the book. There's a there's a page or two that say 50 more greatest cartoons or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's where I listed other cartoons I thought were worthy, you know, but they didn't get the enough votes. Or maybe maybe we got a lot of votes for them, but not enough to make the cut. So, um, yeah, I yeah, saw, I saw it's, it's funny that you mentioned that I saw you were talking earlier about Leonard Malton. I saw an interview yeah. with Leonard and Bill Farmer, you know, goofy. Yeah. And, um, Leonard, you know, asked, uh, Bill about, you know, the classic goofy cartoons and some that were the most impactful. And I yeah. think the only one that, uh, is in that book that Bill mentioned was, uh, clock cleaners. And he also mentioned stuff like lonesome ghosts and, right boat builders and those three have a lot of like classic goofy in it and then bill went on to say that another one uh that he thought was a classic goofy 
would be Goofy and Wilbur because that is that was his first solo yeah. cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Those are great answers. I mean, you know, quite frankly, I, I like the cartoons from Goofy and Wilbur up all of those uh, that and, and all of the. All, all the, the how to things, cartoons, yeah, how to's and all the ones in the 50s and things like that. That there's a lot, it's very rare that there's a bad goofy cartoon. Um, goofy is great in those early ones with Mickey and Donald, um, but those aren't you know, he doesn't, he's only in a third of those films, but mm -hmm. um, um, uh, I mean, all of that stuff's classic and yeah. uh. It's it's so difficult to. I've done on my blog. I've done occasionally throughout the years uh, little lists. Uh, my favorite Warner Brothers cartoons. My favorite. Uh, yeah, I've done uh, some some stuff like, like that, that uh, on this uh, show as well. I've done little retrospectives of like TV yeah. shows. Like these are my favorite episodes. Uh, and actually, to all the listeners, with the actors' strike happening, and as I said, it's affecting uh, people coming on the show. I've been writing more of them. So there are going to be some go. more coming soon. So that'll definitely give you guys something to enjoy while we yeah. wait for the strikes to finish. Do you have Do you have any other questions for me about my career, <laughs> about my so-called career? <laughs> I do. Um, I would love to talk about uh, the Rugrats movie because you uh, co-developed that. I grew up with Rugrats. I don't know if you can see, but I'm, I'm wearing a Nickelodeon shirt and there's oh. Rugrats on it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I it's it's funny. I remember Rugrats from when I was a kid, but I don't remember specific episodes. It's only just like maybe two years ago that I started rewatching it, and especially with the reboot happening now, right, right. Um, I decided I wanted to start rewatching, and I've been binging the original Rugrats. Yeah. I have watched quite a bit of the new Rugrats, and I I really do like it. Um, I met Tara Strong about a year yeah. and a half ago, and. She was in Rugrats and Powerpuff Girls, and I said to her, when I grew up as a child, I, I if we did a school project, what do you want to be when you grow up? I wrote a Rugrat or a Powerpuff Girl. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. The, and so, um, so you yeah. co-developed the Rugrats movie. What was your... Um... Well, co-developed sounds like I had a lot more to do with, with it than than you're saying, but I'll, I'll explain okay. my, my involvement. Please the, do, yeah. Um, I want to also say, if you're re-watching them, uh, one that I point out to my wife, uh, that I think is like my favorite one because it makes me, it actually really makes me laugh. And I think the performances in it are really good. It's one called, you'll, you'll, you know, go through the list and find this one. It's called um, Spike the Wonder Dog. That's the name. Yes, of it. that actually is one of my very favorites. Yeah, that's one of my favorite ones. I, I, I just think that's, that's, it's just funny. The situation is funny. I think, um, uh, you know, the voice performance uh, is really good. And I, I, I you know, it's, anyway, so that's, that's one I like to point to people if you want to watch one of the original ones and get an idea of this flavor of the show. That that to me sums it up pretty well. Um, the what happened there was, and you here I go again. You know, you got to learn that if you ask Jerry Beck a question, you're going to get some long historical answer. And I'm totally okay with that. All right. Well, this will probably possibly be our last question for today. Maybe yeah. I'll come back and regale you with more of my tales afterward, but. The um in the 90s, in the 90s, yeah, the 90s. I started off the 90s at Streamline Pictures doing what I said. And then I think I mentioned to you that I left the company around 1992 or so, and uh, maybe 93, one of those years. And I ended up uh, writing the book, the, the, putting together the book of uh, the 50 greatest cartoons. And, um, let me remind myself what I did next. What I did next after that particular book was I, a friend. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Let me, let me also back up a notch. Remember my story, if I'm ever doing a bio someday, I don't know how I'm going to do it because it's by, it's trifurcated. I was going to say bifurcated. What I mean by that is it isn't linear as much as the way I'm telling it to you, this happened then that happened. What happens is this happened, that happened, that happened. And then there's another layer or two of this happened. It's like multiverses in every year. So let me backtrack. <clears throat> in 1988, 89, when we were starting Streamline Pictures, I'm sorry, this is now going to be a long story, but I'm going to make it as brief as I can. Take, take we started Streamline needs. Pictures. <laughs> we started Streamline Pictures. We um, We were working out of our respective homes 
uh, in my case, a small studio apartment. I was literally calling up theaters and trying to book Castle in the Sky. And I had the film prints in my apartment. I mean, it was not the way you can't do that. You have to have an office. You have to have a place. But we didn't have that. So uh, eventually, so eventually I told my partner, who was like me, we were both freelance people. We were doing, he was doing some freelance producing of TV shows. I was writing books and doing other things. And Streamline was kind of like a hobby that was coming together as a business. <clears throat> So at one point, we were friends with a, a guy who's uh, controversial today. So I'm going to downplay that a little bit. But we were friends with a very uh, who guy who became famous, but was pretty much unknown back then, who was quite a, a go-getter and an, an amazing talent as an artist and animator and a guy with vision. And that person's name was John Chris Felusi. Yep. Do you know that name? I do. And for any of the listeners who don't, um, John Chris Felusi created Ren and Stimpy. Uh, right. you, can, you can say you can just stop right there. All right. So then. So, yeah. That, well, yeah, that, that, that's basically what he's known for. John Chris yeah. Felusi. Yeah. Now John, now, John, again, I could probably do three hours on John, but John, John and I met uh, years earlier. He was a fan of my books. He was a big cartoon fan. He is a big cartoon. He's probably. I used to, at one point, I thought, oh my God, I met somebody who is a bigger fan of animation than I am. And it's John Christopher Lucy. Because I thought I was like the biggest fan that I knew. Um, and um, and we became friends. And um, and it's and there's more to that story. But by 1988, 89, my partner, Carl, who had done Robotech, coincidentally, this is totally a, on, a, on a side note, he also met John, and they were, Carl was quite the opportunist. He was always trying to pitch new ideas to the studios. And So when he met John, John was a young guy who nobody, nobody knew, and like, you know, hey, you can help me pitch my ideas. They were really polar opposite personalities. But uh, Carl uh, took John out to see many, many, many places producers studios thing i remember them they they they, they uh pitched to saturday night live uh I, I say i remember this because i was working with carl and i was friends with john and we all decided when we were dubbing totoro the 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 the, the sound studio on melrose avenue in la that we were dubbing it out of was going out of business and we literally at, while we were dubbing it we're going well do you rent any of these rooms out? Because we go, oh man, we'd rent you the rooms because we got no work. We got no work coming in. I go, so we we rented two big rooms in this in this little building on Melrose, right next to Paramount Pictures on in Hollywood. And, and one one of the rooms was Streamline Pictures, and the other room was Spumco, which was John's company with Carl uh to pitch shows. Streamline was my company with Carl to distribute Japanese animation and dub it. And so we were all together in one place next to a dubbing studio that could dub things or record for us. And so right in the same floor. So we were all together. This is like, oh, uh, I guess it has to be 1989 for sure. And um, Carl is constantly going out on pitches with John. I'm constantly calling up movie theaters and trying to get the posters ready and getting the theater and the streamlined pictures stuff done. <clears throat> and um, um, so Nickelodeon is coming into being. Nickelodeon new animation, Nick Toons was an agenda that had just started and they were taking pitches and Carl and John went in and pitched something else that became Ren and Stimpy. I won't go into, I can go into such detail, but I won't. And um, they went in and pitched that. And uh, um, meanwhile, when we started uh, Streamline, um, this is totally side note, uh, 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 a good friend of mine who was, who played little May, we had hired an actress who played the little May, a uh, little girl in, uh, in my neighbor Totoro. And her name was Cheryl Chase. And she had just come to Hollywood and was just starting and dub doing dubbing and any kind of voice work that she could get. And we hired her for, for that. 
And then when we started doing Streamline and Spunko in the same building, in the same studio, in the same place, uh, we asked, uh, John asked Cheryl, hey, uh, I need somebody to answer the phones and uh, help me with this and help me with that. So Cheryl became kind of his assistant and uh, receptionist and even casting director at some point. Cheryl was, of course, a working actress trying, you know, going on auditions and trying to get places. And um, one of the things she did was she, she went to a tryout, an audition for Rugrats. And she got the job of, of Angelica mm -hmm. for that yeah, show. I was just going to say, yeah, Cheryl is uh, well known yeah. as the voice of Angelica. Right. So meanwhile, she's working at the first season of Rugrats. She's also working for Spumco and she's doing all the voices of little girls, women, dogs, anything that wasn't John or Billy West. And it was female, like singing the song log, you know, or any of that stuff. That was Cheryl. And um, uh, so we were doing that. And um, and then. uh I was doing Streamline. I left Streamline. I, I I then, okay, now I'm going back to me. I left Streamline. I worked on 50 Greatest Cartoons. And I became friendly throughout all these years with all the people at Nickelodeon just because they were in my world as it was. And I became friendly with all the people there. And um, and they knew who I was. And I, I ended up, um, uh, when I was working on 50 Greatest Cartoons, uh, uh, one of my friends who was the animation director of, of of many episodes of Ren and Stimpy, his, his name is Bob Jakes, and he uh, he he was the animation director. Uh, if you'll see his name on uh, Stimpy's Inventions and of others, many other of the St of Ren and Stimpy cartoons, he gets a director credit or or an animation director credit. And he he just had gotten a gig since Spumco had closed down. A controversy started, you know things things were changing at uh, Ren and Stimpy. So he got this crazy job up in Canada uh, directing new cartoons using the old uh, uh, character named uh, Baby Huey, an old oversized duck character. And he got the job of doing new cartoons with that character. And unbelievably, I, they asked me to work for Harvey Comics, the people who owned Baby Huey. They had an office in, in L.A. and they asked me to come in and uh, help with some of the production stuff. So I worked, I did that. I ultimately became like a producer on that show. And I worked on that for like a year and a half. And we did a lot of the animation was done in Vancouver and the recordings were done in Vancouver. And I went up to Vancouver a couple of times. And the um, um, while we were doing that show, um, I think I was still working on the 50 Greatest Cartoons during that period, now that I think about it. And um that was again. I had all these bifurcated. I would be doing other things while I'm doing this thing. I haven't even told you about it. My involvement with curating, you know, laser discs and videotapes and stuff. I, I have so many little other jobs that I did at that time. So, right. um, I then I then got I then got asked to uh, interview at Nickelodeon for a job. They were they were starting a new department called Nickelodeon Movies. And uh, which still exists today. They just put out the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. I just saw that last and week. That was Nickelodeon movies. And yeah, it was amazing. The um, I was when when that department started, which was in 1994. Uh, I was part of the the origin origin of that department, and I, I I got hired. I went. I became bi coastal. I worked in New York and L.A. And what happened was, the, I was originally charged by Jerry Laybourne, who, who was the person who really created Nickelodeon the way Nickelodeon is, meaning Nickelodeon existed before Jerry Laybourne, but she came in at a certain point in the 80s and turned it into what we think of as Nickelodeon. Slime, the logo, the orange, the, the shows that are on. She was one who really kind of, she's the one who initiated the Nicktoons. She had a very much a visionary. She, she knew what she wanted to do with Nickelodeon and she hired me. And because she, she hired me from answering one question and I'd answered it the only way I could. The question was, um, what, what do you think a Nickelodeon movie is? And I think my answer was a combination of, it was, it was something like this very short. I was, my answer was, it's not a Disney movie and it's something, <laughs> and it, and it's something more like yellow submarine. I remember saying that. And I saw her eyes go up because you're the guy. That's the, that's exactly what, 
That's that's 100% what we want. Not a Disney movie and something more like a yellow submarine. So that was the thinking then. I got the job and I started to develop all kinds of cool stuff. I'm not going to go into all of that now. Um, and then at one point, uh, Jerry made a momentous decision, which was to leave Nickelodeon, which was a big earthquake at the time. And she actually went to Disney. She worked on Disney's one Saturday morning. And she was like the, the major domo of Disney's television animation at the beginning of that. So that's one reason why the character Doug, the Nickelodeon character Doug, became a Disney character named Doug. Jerry Laburn moved it over when she got the job. Um, so I was there. She was no longer there. And the thinking changed. You know, the, the radical, let's make something different and cool thinking actually changed. Um, but, you know, I, I'm always, I was asked to develop things. And one of the most obvious things that I could even say was, let's make a Rugrats movie because um, at the time Rugrats was actually more popular uh, in the mid nineties than it was when it first went on. It, oh, it, yeah. it had gained in popularity with the more episodes that there were. And Ren and Stimpy was verboten because of all the problems they had with, uh, with him and Doug was being taken over to, those were the first three Nicktoons. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh Nick, Rugrats was was becoming the signature at that time I mean today you could say it's Spongebob and Dora and uh Avatar yeah you know. like my Nickelodeon was Spongebob yeah Fairly Odd Parents Drake right. and Josh iCarly and as a matter of fact a lot of the live action shows that came on Nickelodeon in like the 2010s like the Thunderman's Bell and the Bulldogs Game Shakers those actually helped inspire me to want to become a writer oh wow good I well, just you know, felt writing, so connected to them. The writing is really good on Nickelodeon. I mean, I still absolutely. Remember yep. I, I mean, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen it. it might be before your time, but the uh, Clarissa explains. Clarissa it all. explains it all. Yes. Um. And, one oh, of my, and, and Pete, one, one, Pete and Pete. There was another show called Pete and Pete that was really was, good. Well, it's funny you mentioned Clarissa. One of my uh, yeah. most recent guests was Mitchell Kriegman, who created. Oh that yeah. Show. Yeah. Yeah. And so they were they were very very smart there and. So the reality is, I mean, I was, I'm very proud to have been in the room at Paramount Pictures where Klasky and Chupo and me and my boss at the time, uh, a lady named Debbie BC, we all went in uh, together and we basically proposed a Rugrats movie and uh, something I believe never happens in the real world ever of Hollywood. They don't really, they, they, they usually have to call you back. Let's think about it. We'll call you next week. No, right there in the room green light let's make it i never as far as i know that never happens but that's what happened we walked out of that room knowing we were going to make a a rugrats movie and and then we began looking for the writers and my involvement was more uh helping get the writers and get everything set up for it and and then i moved on to other things so i actually had nothing creatively involved with the rugrats movie itself other than helping to get it make made uh in the first place and um, and that really, once we made the Rugrats movie, that kind of told the tale for the department. I had joined the department wanting to do creative things like Yellow Submarine or something new. I had, again, a lot of stuff that I didn't mention that we were developing. And we were, I was leaving, I left around the time the Rugrats movie came out because it was, it was, I could see the handwriting was on the wall that we were going to make movies based on uh, the TV shows. And that's what they did for a long time um occasionally making a film like jimmy neutron which was it was baked in that that was going to be a series uh barnyard is another one they baked that in that that was going to be a series uh so for me the creativity part of it was out and uh i decided once again after a couple of years to go off on my merry way and try some other new things and that that will lead you to the rest of my story (laughs) but um but uh that was my involvement with that, to be honest. And uh, but I, I had a lot. It was fun being there, and I did a lot of great stuff while we were there. And uh, Rugrats was part of it, mm-hmm. onward and onward. So to wrap it up, talking about yes. developing stuff for like Nickelodeon and all that, I understand yeah. that you uh, made a cartoon pilot called Hornswoggle. Mm-hmm. Horns, Hornswiggle. Hornswiggle. Horns Sorry, yeah. I read that incorrectly. Oh no, that's okay. Um. Yeah, well, 
what I can say now at, in my older years, mm -hmm. in my later years is if I had any goals, I definitely accomplished them all. Uh, and, and I have a few other great ideas I want to do. I'm not done yet, but, and I hope to do them, but, um, but all, if I had a little check mark or a little checklist, a little bucket list or something, I, I kind of did all the things I wanted to do. One of those things would have been to create a show, to to do a, to, to to you know supervise an animated show, if not if not a whole show, a pilot, you know, to actually right. be in charge of it. I had no real ambition to design it because I knew my artwork wasn't as good as all the wonderful people I've met in Hollywood all throughout the years, but to actually run a show, to do something like that. I mean, as you know, I did, I actually did several books about Nickelodeon after leaving yep. Nickelodeon. And I did one mm -hmm. called Nicktoons where I basically interviewed every creator up to the time of the book coming out. I think, I think Mighty B was the last show that I, that was coming out as I did that book and I, an LT gray and all that. So I got to meet all the creators of all the shows and I got to ask them about the creative creation of it. And I got, and I always asked them, about when they when they got the call that it was going to go every single one said the same thing every single creator was destitute and didn't know how they were going to pay the rent next month and then they got the call after pitching it and i thought that was insanely interesting um uh that's just the way i don't i don't even know what that means other than i thought that was an interesting fact the um i i wanted you know i mean who wouldn't want to create a show or do a show or that sort of thing um, left out of my telling you a lot of my story there. And, uh, when I, when I interviewed to go, you know, for Nickelodeon back in, uh, 1994, um, I went in with, uh, one piece of, uh, uh I was going to say evidence, but that's not the right word, but I, I went in there with a prop, um, which was, um, I knew because I was a fan of all animation and animation history, but I knew that, Paramount Pictures, which was which was uh, part of Viacom, which Nickelodeon was at that time, Viacom. Um, I think they had just been taken over by Viacom. I went in there with with a movie poster of the old Terry Tunes from the 1950s. I went in with this cool poster and I said, you know, to, to kickstart what we're trying to do, we can start developing these characters that you already own the rights to. And um, they love that idea. Jerry Laborn loved that idea. And uh, at least we knew we had a, something to start with. And from that moment to even today, uh, I have never given up on trying to convince Viacom, Nickelodeon, Paramount Pictures, CBS, any division of that, that outfit to revive these Terry Toon characters. The characters include Mighty Mouse, Deputy Dog, a superhero group called the Mighty Heroes that had a show on CBS in the 60s, a whole bunch of things like that. And it's all great stuff and waiting to happen. And nobody there knows or cares about it. Anyway, I have I could talk for hours about what I have done my entire life to try to do to try to revive these characters. Anyway, it didn't happen. <clears throat> Suffice to say, it still hasn't happened. And I'm still working on it. But uh, around uh, 2004 or so, 2005, my good friend Fred Seibert. Fred Seibert was at one time the president of Hanna Barbera. He was uh, the person who who started the What a Cartoon program for the Cartoon Network, which begat Powerpuff Girls, Dexter's Lab, Johnny Bravo, uh, Courage the Cowardly Dog. Um, he made pilots with those, and they all became series. He then did the same thing for Nickelodeon. Uh, creating you. Met, it's funny you keep mentioning. Um, I think you mentioned Fairly Odd Parents. That also came out of one of Fred's. Fred was the producer of that show. Um, that came out of one of Fred's incubators, where he gets creators to create pilots. One of the most recent shows to come out of one of Fred's pilot programs was Adventure Time. The in the series that Adventure Time came out of. It was called, it was titled Random Cartoons. That was the name of the series. And he, it was a deal with Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon um, uh, produced 39 episodes, three cartoons per episode, and every cartoon was a pilot uh, created by some other person. One of them was Adventure Time. 
Um, another one, another one was they were looking for people and they basically said to me, do you have any ideas, Jerry? And I said, well, yeah, I'm trying to get these Terry tunes going. I want to revive these classic characters. And he goes, well, you know, come in and talk to me about it and pitch one. <clears throat> Let me see if it makes any sense. <clears throat> so I went in there and I decided I'm going to pitch one from the 1950s because the characters of the 1950s have this really cool look that looks very modern. It looks like cartoons to me today. It doesn't look like an old cartoon. It looks like a modern day cartoon. And the character I picked was this character named Sidney the Elephant. And and they are cool looking cartoons from the 50s. And but nobody knows them. So I went in and I pitched Sydney. And I up front I said this is a Terry Tunes character. And you know that nobody knows. And and it was it was a very interesting experience. I had a year long experience pitching because every time I'd pitch, I'd get a note. I'd get a network note either from Fred or from somebody else. <clears throat> well, it would be this or that. And and then I'd come back a month later and pitch it again with the note. Then they'd have another note. And then I'd come back again a year later. And a part of me was doing other work. And I was thinking, this is funny. I'm going to go along with this. Normally, I'd be very frustrated and say to hell with it. Uh, you guys don't know what I want. I don't want what you want. Forget it. But I said, you know, I'm going to go along with this and see where it leads. It's either going to lead to it never happening. Mm -hmm. And I'll have a good story to tell about how it never happened. Or it's going to lead to it happening somehow. Well, it did lead to it happening. Um, by the time we did the 12th pitch, uh, we had we had a script, we had a writer, we had a rewriter, we had a director, we had character designs, we had artwork. And I still remember driving to that pitch thinking with my director, a guy who on spec, you know, was going to go on this on the off chance it became a show. Mm -hmm. um, I remember saying, I don't know what they're going to say, but they're going to turn it down. And they're going to want something. But God, my God, this pitch is ironclad. There is nothing we didn't already address. Every note is there. I can't, for the life of me, think of why they're going to say no this time. But they will. And they did. Um, we drove in, gave our pitch again with, whatever, with their latest notes. We were 100%. And the note was, the unexpected note at this point was, we want to do it, except we don't want it to be a Terry Tune character. Now, keep in mind, I've been spending a, uh, 12 months developing a show based on one character with certain traits. He's an elephant. You know, I mean, he's 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 a neurotic elephant. I mean, it was I said, we developed this thing. I mean, what do you what do you you, you don't want to do it with that character? And they basically did say to me, just make it something else that's not Terry Tunes. The thing you want to revive, just make it something else. Make it your, it's yours. You will own it. You will own it. Just make it another thing. Well, I was actually pissed because I really wanted to revive the Terry tunes. And right. I didn't, and I, I talked to maybe two or three of my friends. And I said, look, I'm just going to close it down and end it right here. Cause this is not what I want. And this is not going to be good. And I, you know, this and that. And a couple of my friends talked me off the ledge and they said, this isn't the battle. If they're saying, that they will do this. They will green light a pilot. And all you have to do is change the character and come up with a new name. Uh, do it. Try it. And I feel like I calmed down. I said, well, the only thing I would do is I'd change it to a rhino. Because it's. I wanted it. it was, we had the whole thing written. It was a jungle show. Uh, it was a big. Oh, I get it. Orange swiggle. Because right. it's a rhino. Right. Right. And the horns would go, I'm going to give. <clears throat> I'm going to give credit to my good friend Bill Vallely, who was one of the writers of the of the of the show. He came up with the name, uh, and um, and I we went back in and basically did the same pitch again, calling it Hornswiggle. He's a rhino. He's neurotic. He's this. He's that. And then they they said yes, and we did it. And and by the way, after that, the next it was a three or four months in production. Um, and but I have to say it was three or four months in heaven for me. It was wonderful. I, by the way, it was three or four months of production, but it was about another eight months or something. When the animation came back from Taiwan, you know, and we had to put the sound effects in and other things. And and then I worked on that. I was I was like the director, really. I was really the the supervisor of the production because it was my baby because I pitched it. My actual director did the actual directing work of the timing and supervise the animators and they did he did a wonderful job 
uh, Rich Aaron's was his name, and he was one of the directors behind Tiny Toons uh, back in back in that when that was in production, and the, uh, the and the whole thing went very very smoothly. I when when it was all said and done, I saw a lot of things that I would do differently if I had a second chance to do another show. I said, okay, I know what I would do now for the music. I know what I would do now. I learned a lot by doing it. And I didn't, I never really had that second chance per se, but, um, but I, the experience of doing it is a wonderful one that I had. And, and I feel great that it's part of my life because I feel like I've done everything in animation except actually animate. And I did animate when I was in, when I was at the school of visual arts and a student, but I've, so I've done everything. And uh, Hornswiggle, the rights reverted back to me. So if anybody checks it out on YouTube and wants to make a comic book or finance a series with that character, happy to do it. Happy to do it. Uh, um, we even, uh, when we auditioned the actors, um, a great actor whose name I think I can pronounce, Rene Abougenois. But if you look him up, um, Oh my God, the things he's been in Star Trek and oh my God, he's so many things. He was so great. Unfortunately, he passed away right. uh, in recent years, but, but a really, really great actor. Um, and uh, we had a ball making the whole thing and it was, it was a pleasure. Anyway, that's great. I'll leave it at that. Mm. Well, that's all I've got here. Is there anything else you'd like to say to wrap up? Mm. No, but uh, people can check my cartoon research dot com blog every day if they want uh, there's there's hundreds and hundreds of back articles uh some will be of interest to you some will be of no interest to you mm -hmm. some of them will be completely trivial but um but i try to keep that going um and um that's really it uh you know classic animation um you know it's 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 wonderful and uh, there's so much one can learn from it even if you just want to watch it to laugh, uh, there's there's lessons to be learned in classic animation. Mm -hmm. Well, That's first of all, me. well, first of all, Jerry, thank you for joining me for the seventieth nostalgia talk. I I feel like I've been here all seventy times, but no, I <laughs> I, I I'm very happy to be on the seventieth. It'll be easy for me to tell people check out the the seventieth as opposed to the fifty third or something. I don't know. No offense to your guest number 53, but. <laughs> and to all past guests, uh, 70 plus. Guests. The reason I say plus is because, of course, we did that big Lazy Town reunion with uh, the cast of oh, Lazy wow. Town where it was just more than That's, one. And I, I of like course, I show. I yeah. never in my whole life thought that that was ever going to happen. But uh, one of the cast members, I invited him and he said, how about we shake it up a little bit and do a little Lazy Town reunion? Oh, wow. And it's the most popular one I've ever put out. So to all 70 plus guests of Nostalgia Talk, including you, Jerry, and to all listeners of the podcast who keep coming back here, following on social media, links in the description. I hope you keep coming back for episode 71. Again, I don't know what's going to come out of it because of the strikes. Uh, hopefully something good comes out of both that and the strikes. Again, I just hope that people are happy with what ends up happening. That's all we can really yeah. hope for. So that way we can get back to... Uh, uh, I, I strongly believe I strongly believe, and I have nothing to base this on that the writers and actors will get what they want and I'm I have a feeling the studios won't get what they like, but well, as we'll long see. as the actors and the writers are happy, then that's, that's yep. what's, that's what's needed. So I will see you guys for episode number 71 of nostalgia talk. And as I said, I've got some retrospectives on the way. Uh, I actually just wrote, uh, I've been traveling the last week, but, uh, but before I was traveling, I wrote, one of the retrospectives that I won't reveal yet, but uh, you'll see some of those soon. So in the meantime, see you next time. Peace.